Chicago! Free! You might be smarter. Your daddy might own a company, but you will not outwork me. This one right here is for the people. I'm your host, Ryan J. Owens, current pro athlete, entrepreneur, and former USA national team volleyball player. I will not be defined by my athleticism alone, but I've learned how to leverage it to stay passionate about it and prepare for life. That's why the Beyond Athletic podcast was born. I'll bring you case studies of current and former elite athletes making it happen in life as well as tips and lessons from top sources in sports, nutrition, fitness, entrepreneurship, and more. I'm here to tell you that you are beyond athletic. Hey, thanks for joining us. This is a fun episode I did from a cafe in Belgrade with Mari Aquino, Brazilian. She is just now returning back to her team, so definitely check up and find out what she's doing, how she's getting back into her sport after having knee surgery. Very inspiring talk. I love the fact that she was courageous enough to leave Brazil when many don't. She was pushed to learn English, but that shouldn't stop anybody because that is something you can find anywhere. And actually something that the two of us are very passionate about figuring out solutions for how we can help athletes move around the world as athletes, whether that's for education or for work or for life. basically using volleyball as a vehicle and in this episode I love how she just gets into the things that drive her that drove her before and what she's aspiring to do so I hope you enjoy it please uh, bear with us whenever I had to turn my mic on of course I'm in a cafe in Europe so it's a little bit loud but I try my best to clean up the audio and if you do like this if it makes you think of anybody especially some foreign younger athletes who may be aspiring to go to a different country for whatever reason, definitely share it with them. Enjoy. Hi, my name is Mariana Aquino. Um, I'm from Brazil in a city called Curitiba. Um, It's the capital of Paraná, which is the state near Rio and Sao Paulo. Uh, It's really nice out here. It's a big city, Um, the perfect size actually. Um, it doesn't really look like Brazil, honestly. Um, it's really clean and organized, and uh, it's located in the south of Brazil. I love to, to live here and everything, so nice. So um, my dad and my mom are together. They're married for about, I think, 30 years now. Um, I have a little brother. He's 16 years old. His name is Enrique, like Enrique Iglesias, kind of with an H in the beginning. Um, And um, he lives in Michigan, actually, now. He's in exchange program um, for a year with uh, high school and soccer. So he's he's an athlete also, and he wants to study in America as well as I did. Um, And we're a pretty big family. I have a bunch of cousins, and my grandparents are alive, and we get together on Sunday to have lunch all together. And... uh, it's a very traditional Brazilian family. We're all really happy and loud and, you know, um, really close to each other, which is great. Um, they're really a big support for me. They always um, supported me with all of my decisions. Um, um, they're not athletes like I am. Um, my mom is a doctor, but she also played volleyball in high school. Uh, and my dad, um, he's a businessman. He works with insurance and, um, but he, uh, he loves, um, sports. He's involved with soccer here with like pro teams and everything. So he really helps with my career. Um, so they're really involved in my career. And that, that was a big thing for me with all my decisions. They, they always participated in them. So, um, you know, I thank them with everything. So, yeah. All right, so tell me a little bit about how you got into volleyball as a kid and what it means to you. I always loved sports um, since I was really, really young. Um, And then in school, they had this, like, initiation to sports. Um, So since I was seven years old, I practiced all sports. So, like, soccer, track and field, volleyball, swimming. And then I got into swimming really young and I competed in swimming and everything. I was really good at it. And, uh, but then 
I was also really tall and I loved volleyball because of how dynamic it is. And I love team sports and swimming kind of felt a little lonely for me. So I switched to volleyball when I was 10 and then um, I went to club volleyball when I was 12 and that's when it started getting serious, I guess. So I played for school and I played for club and then, um, you know, I always loved um the sport itself. So that was easy for me to continue doing it because I was passionate about it. I didn't feel the pressure when I was younger. I just was doing what I loved and I had so much fun with it. So that's how I got started in school with this initiation process of it. I got to test it out all the sports before I chose volleyball. And then, you know, that's what I identified myself most with. Awesome. So just so people understand the structure in Brazil, what is that like for you to be a volleyball player? How do you get into clubs and can you play with schools and et cetera, et cetera, leading up to, let's say, your decision to go to the States? Right. Um, In Brazil, it's a lot like it is in America. You play for school and you play for club, but mostly your club and your school team are kind of the same. They have kind of a partnership with the school and the club. So um, it's better for you to play for a club because you get like seen more often by bigger teams and even universities in America and stuff and go to state teams and everything. So we also have, like I said, state teams. So if you make the state team when you're like 12, 13, 14, and you play like national championships with this this state team, um, you get a better chance to move forward instead of just playing for the school. So um, that's what I did. I started playing for the school. And then, like I said, when I was 12, 13, I went to the club that is partner, partnered up with the school. And then I started getting well known and then, you know, getting more championships and everything. And then I made the state team about when I was about 15. And then with the state team, I got to be in the national team and everything. So I don't know if that's exactly what happens in America, but in Brazil, it's kind of like you going up and up as as more as you get more involved with volleyball and more involved with like different championships and everything. Tell me a little bit really quick about the, the national team. So you said you made it from the state team, which correct me if I'm wrong, but when you say state, so a state, for instance, in Brazil would be, for instance, a very large region that covers many cities because you don't technically have states. And I... I just want people to understand it because I played in Brazil and yeah. I know what you mean. Um, yeah. So it'd be like a, a, a region in, in the States, for instance, we would have like a few different States together. And that's one that would be like almost like Conference, a for yeah. you guys. Yeah. But that would be our region actually. Right. So your region is more like a state, right? Uh, yeah. So um, like you say, California is a state. My state is Paraná, and um, this state selects the best players every year by age. Um, And those players, they practice together for like a small period of time, and they play two to three tournaments. So like, and then those players playing this tournament, they play against other states with their state teams. And... uh, that's when you move forward. That's when you move up. Because if you get selected for the state team every year, then you get to see, like, show yourself and you get invited to different other teams. And that's what happened to me. When I was um, 14, I started to play in the state teams. I got selected for teams that are older than me also. So I'm like, I was born in 1991. So I got to be on the state team since 1989, which are like girls two years older than me. And then I got to show myself. And then after I played a bunch of, they call Brazilian championships. They're like really competitive when you're at this age. That That's the the, the top what you can do, you know, the, in the, they call it nationals, right? But then you represent your state. And that's how they get to know the athletes. That's how they get to select them and organize the whole thing. Um, and then you play this nationals and then you get invited to play in different teams. So, um, my state Paraná is really good for girls when they're like 14 to 16, 
and up until 16 years old, it's a really good state to play in because it's a high level. They, they have high level club teams and everything. But if you want to move forward and play higher, higher levels, you have to go to Minas Gerais, Sao Paulo, Rio and play in those teams. That's what I did. I got invited to play in Minas, which is a really traditional team for the Superliga, which is the pro league. So I played with them when I was 16. So I moved away from my house when I was actually, I left home when I was 16. So I played club and school for them. Um, and But I still was a part of my state team in Paraná. I couldn't be on the Minas because Minas is located in the Minas Gerais state. So I, since I was not from Minas Gerais, I couldn't be on their state team. I was always coming back, going back to Paraná to play the nationals. And then when you get selected to the national team, if you are good enough to be in it, and then they, they, they select the best state players, and then you go to Rio, Sacorema, and you practice in there. They have a big center uh, where all the national teams are, like sub-16, sub-17, sub-19, sub-20. These days they have sub-everything up until adult, but my on my time they have only – sub 17 and sub 19 or something like that so yeah that's how it works nice and just a, a quick note on the, the the club system so you're playing in your let's say the high school and club systems there and then you have your state program but when you went to minas right you went into a club that not only has like hundreds of sports i think but uh you went to a club, I'm not sure on that. I know they have a ton of sports. I know it's one of the oldest clubs. But um, just to talk about the structure of that particular club, because when you say I went to go play with a pro team, you're not actually playing with the pro pro team, or are you playing with the pro teams? Because there's many clubs that go throughout there, kind of like the U.S. system, where they have like the U18 and down. They have down to like... Mm -hmm. 13 sometimes, so usually 15, right? 15, 16, 17, 18. So can you explain that just so people understand it all the way up to the pro and that it's one club? Yeah, um, it's this is good here actually because we get to see the pro girls uh, practicing, which is very inspiring. Uh, they're at the same place, the same gym, you know, after our practice, they go practice. And we, I remember myself just like sitting there and watching them uh, play like idols um, it was nice to be in Minas Minas has like uh, from I think 10 years old uh, team sub 10s or something up until pro they're all separated um, so the only pro team is the actual pro team but we all practice in the same place uh, we all go to the same gym um, you know and I don't know. It's like the other sports are also cool because they work the same way. So it's a big community and the same, it's this huge club. We have like about five clubs like that here in Brazil that have a bunch of sports and they have the, a really great structure and their history and everything and the fans and all. So um, those are the clubs to be in for sure because you get inspired every day to see those girls practicing. And then um, I decided to go play in America so I didn't play pro. Um, so up until I, uh, up until the, 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 like, I, I think sub 17 is what you call in, in America, which is like the division before you go to university, I played in Minas. And then I was like, I want to study for the SATs and go to United States. So I won't sign anything pro. I will just go there. Yeah. Which is a great segue to basically how did that come about? Why did you choose that? Uh, what were your first steps when you chose to do that? What were, you know, and then, I mean, you can tie into that because we don't want to jump into the massive, massive story behind it, but we do want to highlight some of that journey, you know, like thinking about it, actually starting to move towards it, realizing what you have to do right up until. It was, yeah. It was a huge, it was a huge and fast process for me. I wouldn't say that that's like, the ideal for everybody because for me it happened really fast. Um, I decided I started to get offers from smaller universities um, when I was a sophomore in high school or something like that. It never really interested me because I was in a really high level in Brazil and I wanted to continue play in a high level if I wanted to leave Brazil. But like I said before in my background, my mom is a doctor, my dad is a businessman. 
um, I always valued having a diploma. So um, that was a big worry for me when I was here in Brazil, like just playing volleyball wasn't enough for me at that point of my life. I was worried about having a plan B, a plan C, you know, and um, uh, to guarantee my life after sports. I knew I wanted to play uh, professionally. I wanted to be a volleyball player and athlete, but I always wanted to have that plan B with me. Um, and it wasn't even the pressure of my parents. It was more like the way I was raised and that came naturally to me. So um, I started thinking about it when I was a senior in high school, which is pretty late. And um, um, I had the director of Minas and her daughter was studying for the SAT. And she, uh, the director of Minas was an Olympic volleyball player before. She's really well known. And she told me like, um, your English is really good. Um, you're fluent. You did uh, English courses outside of your school your whole life. So you have potential to pass the SAT in a small period of time because you speak English really well and your level of volleyball is really high. So you can get really good offers out there. Um, so let's try to connect you with an agency that sends um, athletes from Brazil to America. And I will uh, send you some YouTube videos of uh, top 25 NCAA volleyball teams. So you can watch and see that that's not what you think. They're really good and they're really well structured and the level is high. So that's how I started. And it was literally June or July of 2009 when I started thinking about it. And I was supposed to be in college by summer 2010. So that's really fast. Um, and so I started looking at the videos and talking to the agency, which is called Daqui Pra Fora. It's an agency from Sao Paulo. And um, I started talking to them and I had the material already uh, from past games and I had this uh, whole CV, you know, and it was good. So I started prepping everything and building up the material. I hired them. And then I was like, you know what, it's impossible for me to keep being away from my home and studying for the SAT and practicing all day. I need to study for real. So I moved back. So I left and I moved back to my city. Um, I had about, oh, it was so fast. I had about three chances to pass the SAT. So I moved back around November and then um, I, I did my first try in December just as a trying. I didn't even study that much for it. It didn't pass. So um, yeah, it was like, in a summary, it was very intense because I was studying for the SAT. I didn't know if I was going to pass and also sending my material through the agency to the university. So at the same time I was pass, like trying to pass the SAT, I got um, about 21 full scholarships um, for me while I was studying for the SAT. And I didn't know if I was going to pass the SAT. So I don't recommend this timeline for everybody. It was like, for me, it happened that way. But uh, if I was going to recommend, start looking at the process when you're sophomore of high school or something, because then you have the time to study the SAT and then it's not that nerve wracking like it was for me. So um, that's why basically I always valued diploma. I always value a high level of volleyball. And as some of you know, I went to UCLA and UCLA had uh, every aspect of what I was looking for uh, when I decided to go there. It was literally everything that I wanted for sure, you know. Yeah, good segue. So you chose volleyball and school mm -hmm. and diploma and you said, okay, I'm going to go to UCLA out of these, you know, 20 plus schools and uh, just walk us through what that decision meant to you uh, briefly because I know that you are newly going to be one of our Beyond Athletic mentors and work with us on this project where we want to educate kids worldwide, right? The athletes and help them how to utilize sports in their life, grow as humans, all that jazz. So we'll definitely cover that, right? And this process yeah. in your takeover on Beyond Athletic podcasts on um, Instagram soon. But just kind of highlight how that went. So you you show up. What did that mean to you? What was it like? And then you graduate. Um, so starting to my decision process to go to UCLA, I had three aspects in my head when I was going to choose a university because all of them are amazing. So um, I had UCLA as my top pick because it had first volleyball, 
great sports program that I respected. I thought it was great history, everything. Uh, that was my priority. Second, academics, um, a university that um, is well known. It had the courses that I was looking for. I, I wasn't sure what I wanted yet to do, but I knew that they had at least three three courses that I was looking for. And three, location. I'm Brazilian, so I don't like cold places, uh, places that snow and anything. And I like big cities. I don't like really, really small cities. So um, those are the three aspects I was looking for. And I knew from the start when I was choosing that I wasn't going to be able to put all of three together. That was impossible. But then UCLA made that possible for me. But it's really rare because you either get a good program in a really small city or, you know, either way. So you... It, it depends from case to case. Um, but yeah, the up until I graduated from UCLA, you said? Sorry. Okay. Um, you know, long story short, um, it, was a, it was a really um, intense uh, experience in every aspect. And I recommend it to everybody because it made me a better person, a better uh, professional and um, well-rounded professional because um, I was out of my comfort zone completely. Um, my English was not great. So the first two years I had no foreigns on my team, only Americans. Um, so that pushed me really hard to learn the language and um, um, the volleyball, I was so different, but great because you get a different school of volleyball, which only can add up to your uh, skills as an athlete. And um, uh, the way you get well known by like being professional, I think UCLA was great with that. We always had seminars and meetings by how you can portrait yourself in social media. How can you uh, be better with nutrition? How can you be better with physical therapy? You know, they educated us throughout these four years. And that was crucial for me because that's the time when you're like 19, 18, up until 22, when you're like grow growing as an athlete, as a woman, and as a person. And that was, you know, really important for me to have the support. I feel like if I was just playing professionally, maybe I wouldn't be that aware that I need to be, um, you know, focused on a lot of aspects, not only just going to the court and playing volleyball, I need to be aware of other things, you know, so um, today, I feel way more secure and of myself as an athlete because I had that experience in college and you know touching bases and what you said being a mentor um, it's a big thing for me because I want to pass on to other athletes that it's possible to do both it's possible to be educated and uh, study and then also play your sports or it's possible at least when you're growing up and you're a teenager to have a plan A, plan B, plan C, because all of us know that it's a really hard world professionally out there. Not everyone makes it. And even if you make it, it's really hard to stay there too. And it's sports is a small career and you need to think a long term. And if you start thinking long term when you're younger, and if I can give that opportunity to people, I can educate teenagers in order to have that mentality, maybe I can change their lives moving forward. And they don't know it yet because I know how they feel because I was younger once too. I still feel young, whatever. <laughs> but I was younger once and I, I, I had them, I had the same mentality. Thank God I had a big support system at home that kind of taught me, hey, think outside of the box a little bit, think a little bit long term, you know, but I know that's not the reality always. So if I can be a help, then, you know, I feel like my mission is complete. <laughs> yeah, I think that's beautifully said. Um, and like you mentioned, sometimes you're not going to, most times you're not going to have that immense or strong network around you, but you can create that. You can create it by seeking out things like this, other people telling their story, other people who have gone through what you went through, right? And then putting all that together and creating your path that you don't have to do it alone, you know, but you can do it alone, but you're not technically alone, right? So I, I like I like that. That was well said. All right, so let's uh, kind of move to the last little section of this and we talk a little bit more about your volleyball. Um, before we talk about like your biggest, let's say, or 
volleyball in your life as a professional and it could be some life things also because we both know that sometimes when you think about like accomplishments in uh in life sport doesn't always make those top ones although they are pretty freaking cool you never know right um so where did you play after ucla and what are you currently doing so that we can move on to this next piece Okay. Um, after UCLA, I played uh, my first pro league in Turkey, in Istanbul, in a second league. And then I played there. I got uh, best middle blocker there, uh, and that moved me up to uh, the league in France on uh, RC Con. That was my second pro season. We did really well. We played Sev, um, and then we ranked really well. We got second, I think, on the French championship. And then um, I played my third pro season in Romania. And I think that was the hardest year, but also the best one for my career. Um, I got to be uh, playing the Champions League. We made the finals. We got second place in the Champions League. That was a highlight. Um, and then after that, um, I went back to Brazil because coincidentally, uh, Brazil had a team in my hometown. And I always, it was a dream of mine to play in Brazil. I never played professionally in Brazil and I'm Brazilian, which is crazy. So I was like, I need to go. I think that's the time. I feel, I feel mature. I feel ready. Uh, let's do this. So I went back to Brazil last year and I played my first uh, pro season in Brazil in Curitiba, which is where I'm from. I was living at home. It was great. I was close to my family. Uh, it was a great, great, great season for me. I did a great season and everything. Uh, now, unfortunately, as some of you guys know, um, the very last game of the season in the quarterfinals of the Super League, I got hurt. I tore my ACL. So I'm one month post-surgery now. I'm recovering physiotherapy every day and everything to get back and forth on the court as soon as possible. Uh, my plan is to stay in Brazil again one more year. Um, I want to go back to Europe, but right now for my career, uh, what I have in mind, the best is to stay here and, um, it's a great league. I'm loving it. It's really, really strong. So I'm, I'm where I want to be for sure. Fantastic. So tell us what is one of your most memorable, uh, let's say hurdles it could be a hurdle, it could be a hurdle where it was like a failure at that moment or, okay, certainly like a lost match or a whatever, right? But what really challenged you and basically you feel like you had to come back from to gain whatever it is you were after? Um, at some point of my college career, I got really overwhelmed with... Um, studying for exams, um, practicing, pressure of playing, and everything. And then I kind of forgot about um, nutrition, um, like putting everything together that was necessary to be an athlete, because I was overwhelmed with everything. So I kind of lost track of nutrition a little bit. I wasn't really eating really well. I wasn't really working out really well because I was worried about tests and everything. And that's really about mentality because um, I didn't organize myself really well. And crazy enough is UCLA gives you all the tools. Um, you can do it to sex successfully, everything organized, but ment mentally wise, I was overwhelmed. I was missing home, homesick. So I think that was my junior year of college I wasn't my best I wasn't it was right after we won a national championship uh in my on my sophomore year so going up to my junior year I kind of relaxed a little bit because I was like I'm so overwhelmed I'm starting to do really hard classes like upper level classes a lot of poli sci classes and uh that took a lot of my time um I like didn't have enough vocabulary to do the essays and everything so you can't imagine. I was overwhelmed. So um, I, I think that was a mistake of me trying to step back a little bit and look at the situation from outside a little bit instead of being in my head all the time and forgetting the athlete that I was. Um, so it took me a long time to get back on track. You know, by my senior year, um, I think by like half season, I was 
playing my best. But before I was trying to get back on track because off season, I wasn't really taking care of myself. I was more worried about other things than actually volleyball. And um, that's when I realized, you know what? I really want to be an athlete because I care about this so much. It's, you know, taking so much of my energy. So what do I need to be an athlete? Come on, let's remember what you used to do before. So it happens. Those are the hurdles of your life. I'm a human. So I had to go through this to, you know, that's why I say the college experience is really interesting, really good, because you get tested in all areas. And then when you come out of it, you come out stronger and you come out complete in all areas because you have to deal with so many pressures, you know, tests. Uh, SAT, uh, midterm, final, and then playing a national championship and everything. And so, um, yeah, that, I think that was the hardest moment of my career of volleyball. I think that was my junior year of college. That's when I realized I wanted to do this for real. And when I put my entire being into sports, you know. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and I, I get what you're talking about. Uh, and I didn't play the D1 route, but I know there were times in school and with volleyball and now having, you know, the business for so many years as an athlete. Man, sometimes it just, yeah, you get stuck. And I think uh, in those moments, the takeaway for me from what you were saying is that you were working hard to, to just step away and get some perspective, right? And look at your situation and go, where am I really at? Not where do I feel like I'm at? Like, where am I actually? Because sometimes we get so overwhelmed in our feelings. And I think this is like, I, I like to, to give the example of like, your computer needs to be cleaned. Your house, let's give a better example. Your house, if you just let it go and you don't clean things, maybe you have everything organized, but dust is going to build up. It's going to build up and it's going to build up. And at some point you have to manage that situation. And when you try to clean up after just like a year, of all of that buildup and you're moving things and you're going, whoa, this is under here or that's there. Things are out of place, even though you think they're in place. So you have like this mm -hmm. false reality of things being in place, but they're actually not. And or mm -hmm. they're just like not well, well oiled. You've gotten away from these things, your bread and butter that keeps you on track. And so I think that's a great thing to recommend to anyone athlete or not like if you want to stay on track if you're feeling like you're off track step back and just kind of look at things like what am I doing now or not doing now that I was doing when I felt on track and mm -hmm. successful mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. exactly and then you yeah. will find it you know mm -hmm. but that's really hard if you're not thinking if you're in caught up in the moments because then you just you prolong it and it can take like mm -hmm. you said like, that was a year that was like a strong oh, yeah year, maybe a little bit more to really get over that hurdle. Anyways, thanks for sharing. You agree with that though about the perspective and how to how to I do. Yeah, I do completely. So let's take it to something more like a, a success, something that you deem one of your favorite moments in your career as volleyball player or just your life, you know? Yeah. Um I think my success came in um Probably last year uh, when we played the Champions League. Um, I was living in a really small city in Romania. Um, I had nothing else to do other than volleyball. And I pushed myself to every limit. And I mentally, I was really good because I got to be focused uh, on just what I wanted. I was good eating well, exercising well, uh, playing well. Uh, with all the difficulties around me that could have really bothered me and could have really pushed me down, you know, so many hurdles around me, but I was good mentally because I came to a point in my career where I knew my body really well and I knew what I needed to do in order to succeed, even in harder times. And um, I worked myself up to that moment of the final of the Champions League, even with all the difficulties. So I feel like it's not just the Champions League title itself. I feel like that that doesn't describe a successful moment. I think a successful moment for me was the whole process of being there, being that team and going through all those challenges and going through it and stuck through it and didn't give up. And uh, that was a huge success for me. It was not even the title. It was not even the medal. It was 
um, just pushing myself into a limit that I didn't know existed. I went over it. And I mean, I can, I cannot tell you like, Oh, it was easy. No, it wasn't like I thought about giving up every single day and I stuck through it because I knew, you know, and th that comes back to taking you out of the thing to see the perspective of it. And out because I took myself out of the situation and I thought, what do you want? Why are you here? Why are you doing this for so many years? Like that, or that were, those are the questions that kind of helped me because I kept asking myself this and that gave me strength to keep going because I knew exactly what I wanted. My mission is, and you know, and that kept me going. Doesn't matter if uh, something bad happens around me, you know, so um, that really helped for me. So success, yeah, success was a whole year of pushing myself and at the end getting luckily the greatest achievement of my career. So quite possibly, maybe more. We don't know. Yeah. Once you're able to get until back. Now. <laughs> until now. Until <laughs> now. Um, awesome. Thanks for sharing. And I think that is a really uh, important note, you know, that it's the work of that year. It's not the actual, like, just the, the acknowledgement of it is nice. It's special. It's a precious moment. But, like, all of that work. And when I look back and I think about things that mean the most to me, it's when I had to work the hardest. Hands down the hardest yep. anything that's ever been like i've gotten it but it didn't come with a lot of work it never had the same value ever and so i'm like i really truly believe that if i want to do something special i have to be willing to push myself into that uncomfortable zone where mm -hmm. i can make it through it and i just don't give up you know it's not true mm -hmm. for everything as an athlete i think there's a really important um lesson that we all have to learn is that we might want to go somewhere but that path is going to be riddled with all kinds of hurdles and potholes and whatever people and situations right and we have to learn how to pivot like in basketball if you're going one direction you have to change but you're still going the same direction you just choose a different path to get there um i think that's really really important and that takes us to this next and, and last set, like section where i think it's really important where we can give athletes Kind of like a toolbox what are the things that you feel helps you along this way because every time we go through these you know difficulties we get over these hurdles or we get over all of the hurdles of one block of life right yeah we were like oh wow there's a better way to do things um i was talking today to what i hope to be a future guest and i mentioned him to you um branco a doctor here and he was mm -hmm. talking about the uh the circle of knowledge and how like when you what you know is like, okay, what you know. And then there's a circle out around, around that. And that's like you and kind of like your current potential doing what you're doing. But then there's that knowledge outside of it that when you learn about that, you realize how little you actually knew. And that just mm -hmm. is like a cycle, right? Because there's right. limitless. And mm -hmm. uh, I would like to share with people, like, like if you share with people, some of the, the tips, the tools, the things that you have figured out now help you on your path and if you were implementing them before they would have helped you get over some things too or through some things um the very first thing that reminds me um that i can say is don't compare yourself to your idol or to your inspiration let them inspire you but up to a limit because if you compare yourself to them um, you're going to want to follow the same path that they did. And it's impossible because their path is their path and your path is your path. So an example of that, um, that middle blocker that is really famous, that I really inspire myself by seeing her playing since I was young, she made the national team when she was 16. She was in the Olympics when she was 21. Um, you know, and, and if you think that you have to do the same thing as she did, you're not going to succeed. You're going to keep imitating someone else and forget about your own body, your own structure, your own psychology. You're, you're unique. So you need to inspire yourself, inspire on her, like, oh, get the things that she did as a tool for you, but really focus on what you do best. What's your strength? Because you're unique and you have your strength 
that she doesn't have. And you can use that for your advantage to get where you want to be. So I think that's the first thing that I say. It's a life lesson that I should have used when I was younger. Because when you're younger, you're influenced easier because you're not, you know, well matured yet. So you try to follow other people's paths because you think that's ideal, but you have your own. So you have your own timing for everything, not just volleyball, but in life, you know, personally, professionally, your own time. So that's like my biggest, biggest advice for sure. My second one is strictly volleyball. Um, when you're on the court and you make a mistake, uh, allow yourself, I allow myself two seconds to feel it. And I really feel it. I feel it completely like, oh shit, I'm, I'm sorry. I made a mistake and it was bad. Everyone is looking at me. Um, my team is disappointed. Two seconds. Right away, I was like, okay, done, forgot it, move on. Don't let yourself remember that much. You know, try to practice that in practice. On your practice, when you're practicing every day, when you make a mistake, allow yourself to feel it for two seconds and then let it go. Just move forward because that gives you an, enough time to heal and then to think about the other action. Because if you just keep thinking about what you made a mistake, you're going to start get, letting the fear really gets to you and then you you make other mistakes following that and that that helps me it's a psychology it's not gonna happen right away it's years of practicing but today you can see if you look at my videos playing you, you will see the reaction really quickly and then I'm like out of it and I'm move I moved on and that really helps me so few tips so with that I just have to ask do you have any like verbal or um like it could be internally or uh physical cues that you do or think or say that help you on that path that you figured out will help you be able to do that yeah um I try to stay positive on the court and really talk loud that helps me uh, that's part of my personality. I know people, there are players that are quiet and for them it's easier to concentrate. For me, um, I like to talk to my teammates and um, give them incentives and everything when I'm feeling a little overwhelmed. So if I'm feeling the pressure a little bit, I like to touch my teammates, talk to them, give them a little clues or something or talk, let's go, uh, clap my hands. That helps me. Uh, feel like I'm a part of the game again, feel like I'm back on it. And I'm a uh, important part because sometimes you are not doing well and then you distance yourself from the game and that it doesn't allow you to concentrate. And then you keep making mistakes and you don't feel connected to the team. It's a team sport. You need to feel like you're all tied up in the court and then you're all moving together. That's how you win games. So if you feel like you're outside of it, just try to connect by talking to your teammates, giving them positive feedback, um, just try to talk and be present in that moment by talking. I think that by talking is the best way, but talking loud, giving them some positive advice, that really helps me get back on it, you know? And what were your other things? If there were any more? You said one. Yeah. yeah. Um, try to give yourself some um, routines. So I feel like the crucial moment for for uh, for us volleyball players indoor is we play together, we do everything together. But the only uh, part of the game that is just you and it only depends on you, what is it? Serving. So when you're serving back there, it only depends on you. The ball is in your hands and feel like the only way to be a good server and not make that many mistakes is if you create a routine for your serve. Just create a routine. I don't know what you want to do, but myself, I, I, I put the ball on the ground. I, I clap the ball on the ground for like, a, I don't know, a number of times. I don't even know because it's so automatically in my head, but I do it. And I, when I watch a video, I do the exact same thing. And if I don't, I make a mistake. If I rush myself to serve, I make a mistake. If I take too long, I make a mistake. So I tap myself. I, I think I, I touch the ball and I put it in the air a little bit and I grab it again. I think I move my hair and then I serve. And that helps me because it's a routine. It works every time. It makes me feel safe. It makes me feel like I prepared myself for that moment. And that goes beyond serving for everything. When you're siding out, when you're going to pass through reception, your setting or whatever. Just create a routine in your head. It doesn't need to be, you know, well, like me, like overwhelming, doing clapping, ball, whatever. But 
create a routine. That's my tip. <laughs> Love it. I mean, it goes back to um, in the morning, how you start your day, you know, how you live your life is really determined a lot about how you start days and end days, right? Yeah. I mean, massive, massive routines and, and habits. There's a great uh, uh, video I, I, I recorded with Marco Soltero. And he was here last year at the Combine, and I'm going to pass that along to you, and I'll link it up in whatever I put online for this, right? Cool. But, uh, it talks about exactly that, and I love it. Oh, my gosh. It's so, so vital. And it also mm -hmm. will help you get through those moments, and it'll help you not have those moments where you feel so overwhelmed because routines and these habits create success, yeah. right? Because you can't, you can't, if you're not in the state of mind, to succeed, there's no way you're gonna succeed because you will overwhelm yourself and fail. It's like a computer that gets overloaded and processes, can't handle it, dead, right? So mm -hmm. that was a nerdy example, but whatever. All right, so let's uh, <laughs> let's go with um, uh, my, one of my favorites. What is your definition of beyond athletic or being beyond athletic? It's not just thinking about going to the court and practicing and playing and, you know, uh, playing volleyball. It's beyond the sport itself. Um, it's thinking about um, how can you be a better person with the sport? How can you help people in your community with the sport? Um, it's thinking about um, the connections, the network you can make. Uh, it's thinking about nutrition. It's thinking about psychology, sports psychology, visualization, physical therapy, everything that involves being an athlete and what an athlete represents to your community and what you can do to help other athletes too, you know, because being an athlete gives you a platform and it's a healthy and great platform that you can use your advantage and you can use to help other people in all areas of being an athlete, not just playing volleyball. It includes nutrition, physical therapy, includes um, networking, includes how to behave yourself on social media, everything beyond athletics. So that's why I think it's really interesting for me to be a part of this, a mentor, because I value all those things. I think all of those things combined and well thought and process um, can make you an even greater athlete, a complete athlete, you know, not just for yourself and your own goals that you want to achieve but for your community and moving forward to people that you want to help or you might help along the way. Wonderful. I am going to just share my gratitude, which will be the last thing. Uh, feel free to say anything about that and, and how people can connect with you. But um, just hearing what you said alone would mean the world to me because I know that at least 100, at least maybe 200, possibly more we have some episodes right now that i'm super excited about i mean they've had over a thousand listens and that means that there might be a, a thousand humans out there that have gained something from you or i or others you know and so just thank you really from the bottom of my heart for being gracious enough patient enough you're rehabbing you're in a bed right now because you can't stand and sit and do normal things and thinking about others and knowing that by thinking about others and by caring about others and working towards helping others, you actually don't take away from yourself, you add to yourself. And I think yep. that that's a concept that is, uh, it's hard to wrap your head around at first because you're actually giving something out. But by giving something out, you truly receive so much more and it's in ways that you can never imagine, which are actually the valuable ways. I think most of the time it's like, how we think something might impact us or be valuable to us is not really how it's going to end up being. And I think that's powerful alone. Also, don't let me forget, you need to connect with, but first hear the episodes by Therese Crawford because just listen to both of her episodes. Trust I me, will. the next couple of days and you'll be like, yes. And we will set up a call because I know that's just gonna, it has to happen. So thank you okay, so much. Great. And, uh, anything you wanna leave? this with like any notes and then how to connect with you for athletes yeah um i would like to thank you ryan uh so much for giving me this opportunity to share a little bit of myself and my story um you know it satisfies me a lot to know that i can get to people that way and i can help at least a thousand maybe more i don't know and um 
that's really meaningful for me and made my week and um you know like i like you said i'm going through a hard time right now but it only helps me this only helps me going through this so thank you so much um a way to connect me uh connect with me is via instagram at mari aquino or facebook mari aquino as well uh, you can message me i'll be more than happy to help you out and uh check beyond athletic podcast on itunes or spotify um i'll be there talking to you uh with all my experiences and uh failures and uh successful stories so i'm happy to help fantastic and we'll help people stay tuned uh why don't you spell out your instagram really quick sure uh it's m-a-r-i-a-q-u-i-n-o mari aquino perfect yeah. and they can follow you they can also follow beyond athletic podcast all one word right. because your takeover and you explaining kind of things and helping other athletes along with what you did to be able to hopefully do those if that's what they choose or also equipping them for whatever path they choose because that's what we both believe in is that you're going to be able to choose your own path right so anyways looking forward to it thank you so much and we'll talk soon thank you ryan well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. Make sure you like, rate, share, whatever you'd like, or just knowing that you enjoyed it is enough for me. So if you want to send a DM, you can. If you have ideas for the show or guests, things like that, feel free to hit me up. Uh, I'm on Instagram, Facebook, everything. Be sure to link up with Mari. If you liked what she was talking about, if anything resonated, if part of her story you feel is something that you would like to do and she might be able to help you with it by all means definitely reach out to her you'll find her instagram and her website and everything in the show notes of this episode which is beyondathletic.com forward slash 57 and of course if you're watching this on youtube there are audio versions that you can share on spotify itunes stitcher thanks very much until next time be more what we do in life Echoes in eternity. I'm going to show you how great I am. And this concludes our Chicago show. Please stay tuned.